Welcome to the Iyun Podcast, an in-depth look at Haredi society, Israel, and the Jewish people. I am your host, Ari Koretsky, and I invite you to join us as we confront the challenges, joys, and possibilities of Torah-centered living in an evolving world. The Iyun Podcast. Think again. Welcome back, friends. We are here again for another wonderful episode of the Ewan podcast. And we are back after a multi-episode hiatus uh, with our Ewan Institute founder and director, Rabbi Yoshua Pfeffer, who is going to be joining us. Of course, he was on the first three episodes, which we recorded live in Jerusalem. Here we are speaking now, sadly, via Zoom. Sadly for me, he's still in Jerusalem, but I, alas, am not. But we want to bring Rabbi Pfeffer on for this particular episode because we are going to be dealing with a very important and I would call it sensitive topic that is sort of the elephant in the room in the entire conversation of Haredi Army Service or the, even the, the discussion of the possibilities of Haredi Army Service. And that is what we will refer to as Das Torah, meaning what is the opinion of the great rabbinic leaders of our generation, previous generations as well, will come into play. But those rabbis, those manhigim, to whom the society rightfully turns for guidance in all matters, perhaps large and small, but in this case, there's no larger topic than the concept of communal navigation in the topic of the future of the yeshiva world and where people go vis-a-vis the army. And so this is the elephant in the room because we can have all the conversations that we want about the need to participate more broadly in society, the possibilities and the frameworks that are developing to allow for greater integration. But at the end of the day, we live within a society, again, that turns to these great leaders for their guidance. And as long as those leaders are not sounding the call for some sort of change, then that change is always going to be limited and perhaps should be limited. And that's the conversation we're going to have today with Rabbi Pfeffer. But first, I want to share what this podcast will not be. It will not be a fully comprehensive treatment of the history and the parameters of Das Torah. It's simply not possible. I refer you to the show notes for a link to the classic Lawrence Kaplan article on the topic. And of course, you could search around for many, many more treatments thereof. Furthermore, I think it'll become clear and we have to grapple with the fact that this is not a monolithic topic. Also in the show notes, we reference many different examples of how these attitudes have shifted, sometimes subtly, sometimes more dramatically over time. And Rabbi Pfeffer will reference that as well. Also, to the degree that rabbinical guidance is dispositive in non-halachic or public policy matters, who qualifies? This is also a question that we can't really answer or won't attempt to, but it's something to think about. Do we risk entering a space of pure circularity when we declare particular rabbonim the arbiters of Das Torah, and then note that their Das Torah precludes participation in the army. If we insist that other Abonim who disagree, by definition, are lacking in Das Torah, are we really having an honest conversation about the topic? Again, there may be persuasive responses to that question, but I think we have to be cognizant of its presence. In addition, Some might say this entire conversation is off limits. And I can, on some level, respect a position that argues for, as Chazal notes, even if the Rabbanim say, Yemin is small and small is Yemin, right is left and left is right, we should follow them. Again, that's part of the larger treatment of this topic, that this would demand a total lack of discussion. However, I happen to think that this, when utilized as a conversation stopper, is untenable in 2024. People are desperate for transparency, for a logically compelling case. People feel that their Judaism 
shouldn't be shrouded behind the veil of intense mystery that somehow an understanding of this topic is walled off behind some impenetrable barrier. And so, again, while I can understand the appeal of utilizing this to end conversation, from my perspective, it just isn't a sustainable approach. So with all of those disclaimers out of the way, welcome back, Rabbi Pfeffer. Thank you, Ravari. It's a pleasure to be back on this great show, and especially for such an important and, as you rightly said, sensitive and delicate and nuanced topic of Das Torah. I'm looking forward to it. So the reason I want to have the conversation is, of course, because we can't avoid it. Every conversation on some level redounds to a argument from authority on some level, right? In other words, we can have the most interesting and enriching theoretical discussion. But at the end of the day, if I'm arguing a position of greater integration, let's say, greater already participation, a counterpart might simply turn back to me and say, that's fine. I hear you. But the rabbis, the great leaders disagree. And therefore, there's nothing more to talk about. And far from dismissing this as, again, sort of a a cop-out, the society within the Haredi world, certainly the Hasidic world, but the Litvish world as well, and more and more so over the last number of decades, looks to this sense of authority as the ultimate bottom line. And so there really is no room, it seems, to maneuver in the pure logical sense, right, in the intuitive sense even, without recoursing to that conversation. And rather than just look at this cynically and say, well, you know, this is an issue that we sort of need to, to navigate around. It's an obstacle that needs to be overcome in some way. I want to look at it more favorably because I can understand a skeptical posture when it comes to topics that aren't all that important. When you say, you know what, Das Torah has become this sort of crutch for people who don't want to make important personal decisions or turning for rabbinic guidance for all kinds of nonsensical issues like what kind of car they should buy or things of that nature. But when we're looking at issues that cut to the heart of what the entire societal structure looks like, when we're talking about situations of communal hanhaga, communal norms, what more important issue for rabbinic guidance could there be than exactly these kinds of topics? And so, Rabbi, Rabbi Pfeffer, I, I put it to you from the start, and I asked this somewhat provocatively, are all these conversations, in a sense, non-starters without the imprimatur, and even more than that, the enthusiastic favor of the great Rabbanim of our generation? Right. So first of all, this is obviously an, an important question, and I have a lot to say about this. I think it's, it's important to address it, and I'm happy that we're bringing it up. In many conversations that I have, mainly with outsiders from Haredi society, but often also with people on the inside. I'm asked this question, well, what about the Rabbanim? Who's your rabbinic authority? What about the issue of Das Torah? How do you relate or manage with the question of rabbinic authority? And there's a lot to be said, but let me open up by saying that I think that there is a close and crucial working relationship between people working in the field, doing stuff that's related to the navigation of Haredi society from the field and to the Rabbanim who represent the rabbinic leadership, the Das Torah. You see, every change that happens within Haredi society doesn't happen. Maybe every change is an exaggeration but many changes that happen within Haredi society do not happen from rabbinical authorities. Rabbinical authorities often are individuals who are immersed in their own world of Torah, whether as Rashi Yeshiva, whether as rabbinic leaders in different capacities, and they're not necessarily exposed to the different changes, sometimes radical ones, that are taking place in the field. Classic example of this is Beis Yaakov. The Beis Yaakov institution, schools for girls, 
did not come from rabbinic leadership, from Rasha Yeshiva, from Gedele Poskim, but rather came very much from the field, from an appreciation by Sarah Shnira and other colleagues who appreciated the situation that had become untenable for the spiritual situation of from girls, of Orthodox girls, and needed a drastic change in the entire educational structure for girls. It used to be a home-based education. The girls grew up together with their mothers and were able to pick up the foundations of religion and religious life just by being at home. And that was gradually eroded over the years, over the times of Haskalah and the different movements within Judaism until the situation became untenable, as Sarah Shnira describes. And it was her initiative that built up the schools. And I recommend to you know, people to read the biographies, Seidman's biography or others on Sarah Shnira, and to see just how much initiative it took from the field. Now, Sarah Shnira was not somebody who came to damage or to detract, to diminish Khalila, the orthodoxy, the connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the spiritual well-being of from girls. Exactly the opposite. She was aware of the changes that were taking place within from society, and she came up with a solution. And that solution she began to implement right away. And down the line, Rabbanim were asked about this. And some were fiercely opposed because changes can be dangerous, damaging, and slippery slopes. And for good reasons, uh, the Rabbanim who oppose any kind of changes is for good reason. I, I don't suspect the motivations of those Rabbanim who opposed Sarah Shnira. Until today, you have certain elements within Haredi society that are strongly opposed to Beis Yaakov. In Satma, girls do not learn Torah study in any sense. They, they learn how to cook. And, and that's legitimate for certain communities. But the mainstream rabbinic body, they gave their approval over time. It was an instant, right? But over time, understood, appreciated the need and gave approval. They could have come out against it and banned it, but they gave it approval. And there are similar movements throughout the generation within the firm space and within the Haredi space. Things change. They don't change because of individuals who are instigators. You might have some people like that, but often change happens because society is always evolving, is always changing, is always reacting to what's happening in broader society, in the world, in the Jewish world, outside of the firm society, and then within firm society. Changes take place the whole time. And you have people who are there in the field experiencing those changes and thinking, how do we react to them? What kind of institutions do we need in order to navigate those changes, to regulate them, to try to be the, the stick, if you want, that is tied to this sapling that's growing in different directions and ensure that it stays on the straight and narrow, a little bit like Sarah Shnira, but in, in, in wholly different circumstances and situations. And those will be the people that you're speaking about that are doing stuff. They're doing very constructive, very important institutions, projects, initiatives, and some of the things that I do, of course, will be included in that. And the Rabbanim will then ultimately be referred to what's going on in these different initiatives. And they'll have to think how to react to that. The, the Rabbanim won't necessarily be involved a priori from the beginning, right? The, these are initiatives that will come from the field. Even when I've spoken to numerous Rabbanim about different initiatives, you know, their reaction was, well, you know, we're not going to endorse this because we don't want to be, as it were, promoting this change. We're fearful for what would happen if we would endorse things like male employment, things like academic institutions for Haredim and other things. But on the other hand, we won't oppose it. Okay, we'll, we'll see. You know, let's see 
that there's a constructive relationship going on, that people do stuff in the field, and, and the Rabbanim, the Das Torah, it's like the, like the Supreme Court, La Havdil, in, in Israel, that people can petition the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will decide, is this legal, is it constitutional, or is it not constitutional? Okay, or the, the Supreme uh, in, in Iran, right? You have the, I don't remember what they call themselves. Yeah, it's, it's the Supreme Body. Supreme Council. Yeah. Supreme Council, whoever it is, right? And, and they'll, they'll have veto power, right? They'll have the, the, the ultimate decision. But you know what? In many of my discussions with, with Rabbanim, that the Rabbanim will be very conscious. They'll ask, what's going on in the field? What do the Avrechim say? What, what are people saying in the field? You know, what's going on there? Right? They'll be relying on this relationship with people who are doing stuff, who are initiating things. And, and sometimes you, you, you have to press play. You have to do something. You have to get started. And then, and only then can you, can you, you know, figure out this, how this relationship will take it and, and where will it go within the firm space. So what, what you're really arguing is that all change happens perhaps as a historical point, but also a prospective kind of argument that this is the way things need to be or should be, that all change emerges from the bottom up. It's organic, comes from, quote unquote, the field, the the world out there, and that Rabbanim then react rather than what I think is popularly understood by many, that great rabbis survey a situation and issue edicts or proposals based on what they are seeing develop over time? Well, I'm not saying that there are, you know, no important initiatives that come top down. You know, Dafyomi was a rabbinic convention. It came top down. And that's a social revolution in terms of Torah study. And as well as well as many important initiatives. But if I'm thinking about the kind of changes that have taken place within the firm space, within Haredi society, you know, over the last few decades, whether that's entry into the workforce of women, okay, women used to be just um, teachers, but then over time, that broadened its horizons, and Haredi women became involved in, in a great number of professions, and that happened from the field, right, that change took place from the field because there was a need for parnasa. There was a need for people to earn an income and men were not going to work and the women had to. And that changes, those changes came from the field. And again, Rabbanim, it was, it was a, everything. It has to be tested over time, but ultimately it passed the test of time and Rabbanim gave their approval to these frameworks. That's true for later for, for male employment. You know, for Haredi men to, to go to work, that was something that came from the field. It was a process that evolved over time. And, and it took many years until just a few months ago, in a, a speech by Rav Moshe Hillel Hirsch, he actually said, well, I see that this is a change that has taken place. And we need to embrace Haredi who go to work. And, and, and they're a part of Haredi society. And, and why did he come up and say that? Well, because he surveyed the situation in the field and understood that this is a change that had taken place. A lot of frameworks had been established to empower and enable Haredi men to join the workforce. And he said, you know what? This is a part of us, right? We need to embrace this. If you think about academic institutions that were established for Haredi, in the beginning, there was a lot of opposition to that from certain Rabban in, in, in the Haredi space. Over time, Rabbanim began to, to give the endorsements to that because it was a need. You know, it, it's, a, it's hard to get well-paid jobs without academic degrees. It's possible, but it's not easy, especially when we're thinking about an entire society. And, and of course, you know, Rabbanim themselves, their own disciples and, and their family members m- make use of, of these institutions o- over time. That, that's just the, the way things work. And these initiatives come from the field alongside many others, think about the whole psychological revolution in the Haredi space. In the past, the, whole, the word psychology was a kind of taboo word. It was something that was viewed very negatively as, as, um, as something coming from 
the outside, something goyish, something that ran against Jewish principles. And by the way, I think that suspicion is justified, has 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 grounds to rely on. I, I'm suspicious of not a few elements within psychology and with the way in which psychology is taught at academic institutions. I'm no chassid of academia generally and of the way psychology is taught in certain elements of it, at least within academic institutions. But again, it's a change that happened totally from the field out of an appreciation of the great need for psychological, whether it's therapy, treatments, whether it's to ease the challenges of, of families, whether it's special ed, I don't know, a, a lot of different elements. None of that came top down. That was all from the field. Think about IVF, IVF treatment. Where did that come from? The ability for couples who are unable to have children, kederach kolo aret, to be able to have children. A amazing. You know, that it came from the field. There were Askanim who, of course, brought this into from society. And some Rabbanim were fiercely opposed to this at the beginning. Rav Moshe Sternbuch was fiercely opposed to this, to IVF. He wrote a tshuva, Kedusha it's, Sitzrael, it's, 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 it's a sakana and it's damaging. 20 years later, the same Rav, Rav Moshe Sternbuch, Shlita, it should be well, he said, you know what, it's a mitzvah. Because... It's withstood the test of time. People brought it in. Without people bringing this stuff in, without people initiating the different projects, initiatives, programs, ideas from the field, we wouldn't be getting anywhere. It's only because of those people, because of those changes that, that happen and need to be navigated and need to be br brought in in a healthy way, in a way that's palatable, so from society to Haredi society, then down the line, it can be evaluated by, by Rabbanim. And sometimes you have Rabbanim that, that come out with letters and they say, Rabbi said, we think this is wrong. We think this is bad. And sometimes it's Xerah She'at Tzibur Yocholam Sometimes it's Xerah She'ena Tzibur Yocholam Oitpah. That, that's Torah is a, is a, itself is a, you know, evolving. And it, it's not, it's not, it's not black and white. You know, people think that's Torah. It's, it's all black and white. You ask the rabbi, the rabbi says, well, you know, there are many different rabbis and rabbis say different things. And it's not all homogeneous. If you're a chassid of a certain rabbi, then sometimes you'll be asking the rabbi every question under the sun. Should I engage in this and that business deal? How should I name my kids? Should I move home or shouldn't I move home? That's how it is in certain Hasidic groups. In broader Haredi society, in literary society, again, depends exactly where you are. It's, it's not quite like that. You know, there are communal affairs where Rabbanim are, of course, consulted and, and their word is, is sacrosanct. It has a, a sanctity. But you know what? There are sometimes many different words. Rav Dov Landau, Shlita, and Rav Meisby Bergman did not see eye to eye on very fundamental issues. And what's that story? Well, you know, some will go with this, some will go with this, and, and we'll see where society goes. You know, ultimately, a lot of what happens among the Jewish people depends on, on minute, depends on, on what happens within society. And that has its own dynamic, its own sense of evolution. And, and we're all a part of that. A anyone who's involved in, in the Haredi public, in, in the Frum public, is a part of that evolutionary process or, or journey. And of course, Dastera has a big part in it, but, but it's, a, it's a part within that journey. But the way you're describing this, interplay this kind of unfolding conversation, if you will, between the society and the rabbinic leadership. In a way, it does seem to undermine or diminish the respect that one could have for leadership if you say, look, it ends up being often uh, almost like a rubber stamp. You know, something happens, look at issues over time, such as molestation, which is, of course, such a painful, difficult topic. But ultimately, it improved, I believe, not because of top-down edicts, but because of a community that no longer tolerated something, learned more about it, that might have included secular professionals coming in and, and sharing expertise or academically trained from people. And ultimately, of course, Rabbanim now recognize that, that this is a terrible scourge. But couldn't one say, you know, why didn't the rabbis see this ahead of time? Wouldn't, wouldn't that serve in some way to undermine a person's faith, let's call it? 
Well, what does faith have to do with this? One doesn't have faith in Das Torah. It's not a faith-based principle. It's a respect-based principle. You respect rabbinical authority. There's, not, there's no leap of faith going on over here. Rabbanim are not Nevi'im. This, this is not an issue of, of, of having a, a Ruach HaKodesh. It's a respect for rabbinical authority, which is enshrined in experience, in knowledge, in, in wisdom. But you know what? This is ultimately, this is just tradition. We have a centuries old, if not more than that. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's in the Gemara. It, this is like, it's a millennia old tradition of a lay leadership and a rabbinic leadership and an interaction between them. Now, that's Torah. Again, if it's taken to an extreme, then it says there's no such thing as a lay leadership. Lay leadership is, is a, is a thing of the past. And all you have is rabbinic leadership. All you have is Das Torah. There is no lay leadership. And maybe some people would like to claim that, that that's how Haredi society functions. And it's predicated on, on such a principle that there's no such thing as a lay leadership. But if you have any ounce of traditionalism in your, in your bones, then you'll realize that lay leadership is essential for any society to be able to function and to flourish. And if you want to do away with official representatives of lay leadership, then the society will become the lay leadership. Something has to come from the field. You know, the, the, especially if your, your, your division in the, in the Haredi sense is, is a quite sharp division. D- don't forget those that we uh, respect and enshrine on that pedestal of, of Das Torah are not the people that are going to be exposed to sexual molestation. They're not going to be getting these stories hands-on. They're not going to be dealing with them. Haredi society is, is 1.3 million people big. You know, we need those people in the field, the, 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 the professionals, the, the, the lay leaders, the community leaders who are going to be dealing with, with these issues. And of course, they'll be bringing them, right, on, on some level to the uh, Gedolei Harabanim, but only after we've gone through a certain mileage. Only after we've had a certain experience will this accumulation of wisdom, this accumulation of experience from the field and, and the, the different attempts to handle it in different ways, all that happens in the field, that can't happen in behind, behind the screen. That can't happen in, in a base measure. That can only happen in a, in a field with, with a rich volume of experience. And, and then Rabbanan can say, okay, we, we hear what's going on. We see the different things that are being done. We're aware of the different institutions. And we can say this we think is good. This we want to endorse. This we want to give tacit approval to. Because if we give an endorsement, it sounds like we're declaring a change. And we think that declaring a change is something which involves uh, a danger and a, and a, and a slippery slope. And, and we think that there's a sensitivity to the data we're about in declaring change. And therefore, we declare we, we prefer the path of tacit approval, or we want to go head headlong against it. And, and of course, sometimes Rabbanim do. Uh, all three of these options are, are available to Gedele Rabbanim, either to declare approval, or to give tacit approval, or to go against, or to go fiercely against. All of these are, are possible. Sometimes you want to go against, but you want to leave the option for some people to still do it. Okay, Marava, I don't know, Rav Shach and Marava, right? Went against Marava, but with a wink, okay, I'm going again because I don't want this to be for mainstream Haredi society, but I'm giving a wink because I appreciate that those who, who want and need it, they should use this model. That, that's also an option. There are many options that the Rabbanim can take in how to relate and how to react to these initiatives and, and to these different um, project programs, changes that happen within the field. But that can happen in a robust way only after we've accumulated the experience, only after things have been tried. And I, I don't think there's any Khalila disrespect over here. This is just the, the way things actually work. This is how things happen. You know, the, the Rashba had to deal with the question of, I don't know, is it Begit Isha? Does that apply to men who shave body hair? Okay, chest hair, body hair. 
he said, well, you know, we have to see what's, what's going on in the field. You know, are men doing it or are men not doing it? Now, why didn't men come and ask? Because it doesn't work that way. Not every man will, will come and ask. They'll ask his local, you know, rabbi or, or whatever it is. And and then after a while, it gets to the Rashba. And the Rashba has to give a, to give an answer. You know, what's going on? Do we answer it or do we say, well, the Matthias is different and, and, and it's okay. It's not the best illustration of this because obviously we're speaking about more social issues and that's a, a very halachic issue and the processes are somewhat different. But this is just a description of how things work. I mean, you think about, you know, the Orchayim famously says when it comes to Yisro, why was it that Yisro had to be the one to suggest to Moshe Rabbeinu to set up these courts? He says that sometimes it has to come from the bottom up. Well, it's not only bottom up, by the way. In, in Israel's case, sometimes it has to come from outsiders, right? And that's also an and that's also an interesting point. A lot of the people that will recognize the need for certain action to be taken will actually be outsiders. By the way, a lot of the Rashi Yeshiva in the Haredi space are quote unquote outsiders. Where the people who grew up in the religious Zionist space, where the people who are Bali Tshuva, less the Rashi Yeshiva. But people who are involved in different social activities will be Bali Tshuva and, and, and so on because they have different perspectives that are able to give them a certain insight that you won't necessarily have if you grow up within the system. And, and that's also a part of it. And you're arguing that that isn't an indictment on rabbinic leadership or on the concept of rabbinic leadership. Because again, I think a, a, a purist could look at this and say, you know, if these are great men of, let's call it Ruach HaKodesh in the you know, in the colloquial sense, maybe not in the formalized sense, then they themselves should have this perception already. They should see these needs. The fact they don't see these needs in some way means the needs themselves maybe are not that legitimate. But we see from this Orachayim, and what you're saying is is not that way, but it's but it is an interesting potential indictment. Well, that those purists, I would just argue that those purists are ill-informed. They're, they're just uninformed about about the way the way in which the world functions, including the Jewish world, including the Frum Jewish world, for the last centuries and millennia until today, it would be a very radical departure from anything that we've known to suddenly assume that every initiative and program and idea and development has to come from rabbinic authority. You know, to 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 say that yes, ultimately. It's going to be that rabbinic authority that has to pass judgment on, on those elements in conversation with lay leaders. I mean, think about Knesset members. You know, Knesset members and their relationship with Gdoli Rabbanim. Now, I know that the Knesset members like to, you know, to talk the talk, that we are just shlichet the Rabbanon, but anyone that knows how things work understands, appreciates that there's a dynamic going on over there. Often it's the Knesset member that's going to come up with an idea, that's going to come up with an initiative. Of course, he'll discuss it on some level down the line. It's going to happen. But there's a lot that goes on, which is not coming from the Gudele Rabbanim. And, and it's by, by dint of reality, by force of nature. This is not any disrespect. I think it's disrespectful to place this kind of responsibility on Gudele Rabbanim and expect them to be somehow you know, superhuman, uber mentioned that want to take such responsibilities on themselves. I, as a community rabbi, I don't want to be responsible for every little, you know, question and initiative that comes up in the community. I want people to do their stuff. And of course, once it becomes something significant enough, something which is going to be, you know, relevant for the, the future of the community in a meaningful way, then sure, come discuss it. Let, let's talk about it. And 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 I'll have my say as a community rav. But Rav Aaron Leib was very much in this mold. Rav Aaron Leib was explicitly in this mold. Rabbi Steinman, Zechon Levracha. And he was explicitly laissez-faire. He said, let people do what they need to do. It'll come to me eventually on some level, and I'll have an opportunity to pass down, but let people, that's just how society flourishes. You know, we're not oblivious to the way in which society has flourished over the last few hundreds of years by means of human initiative. And we, w- we also want a flourishing society to be able to handle the, the problems, the distortions, the, the corruptions of our society. And, and sometimes 
unfortunately, it's specifically the more corrupt elements within our society that run to some of the Gdera Rabbanim and, and say, you know, we, we need your protection. And, and sometimes it's, it's abused and manipulated specifically to maintain the power and the corruption and, and certain very negative elements that we have within our society. And Chas that's obviously the greatest disrespect to G'dayli Rabbanim, to manipulate them in ways that ultimately bring a, a, a shame, bring, bring shame upon an entire society. Well, what happens when G'dayli Rabbanim are approached to write letters in support of sexual predators? Does that bring respect to society? Is that what we want? No, we, we have to make sure that there's a, a, a healthy you know, separation of powers, not in the formal sense, but in the sense of how things work. And we, we want to make sure that we're able to do what, whatever needs to be done from the field. And of course, that the Dastur, the, the rabbinic authorities, have the, the, the place on top of the pedal stool to make the ultimate you know, decisions of how to regulate and how to navigate the situation. What, in your view, is the value of having Gdoli Rabbanim, whom se- themselves are so isolated in a sense from what you're calling the field, right? To the degree that manipulation could occur. You know, as one could argue that manipulation should be not impossible, but should be very, very difficult to execute. If the Rabbanim who are being approached themselves were more sort of plugged in to the situation on the ground. Is that itself not a concern? Or you would say, no, it's important that we have great men who are in a certain way detached because of the purity and the intensity of that level of Torah and of Avodah that can only flourish in such a rarefied environment. Well, that detachment is not a, is not a bug in the Haredi sense. It's an absolute feature of what Das Torah is about. Read Rav Moshe's Shiva on Das Torah. He says, well, to have a pure Das Torah, you need to be detached. Detachment is, is a part of having a pure Das Torah because all you study is Torah. Chazanesh, I don't think the Chazanesh expressed it quite in those words. And I don't know if he was quite as detached in, in the sense of studying Torah alone. But certainly that's the tradition. And we have Gedoli Rabbanim who live in a detachment, in a sense of detachment. Rav Shach was maybe a slight exception to this because he was very much a part of and attached and involved in, in the political space and involved himself in, in real politics and issues and so on. But think about Rav Yashiv. Rav Yashiv is absolutely a paradigm of detachment. Uh, Rav Chaim Kenievsky, very different type of character from Rav Yashiv, of course, um, but very different paradigm, but also embodied, personified this detachment. And that's a feature of rabbinic leadership. And of course, it becomes open and susceptible to potential manipulation. That's not a Haredi invention or a Haredi problem. You know, the, the, the fact that power corrupts is something that we know from long human experience. And once you have a certain, you know, chatzel, right, you have the rabbinic courtyard and you always have different personas, different personalities there that are going to be pulling one way or the other. And we have rich experience of that too. And, and again, that it's just, that's just an argument to have a greater separation or, or at the very least, a greater shared sense of responsibility, right, between rabbanim and between a lay leadership that comes from within the community that's aware exactly of what's going on and is able to share the burden of this responsibility. You know, if you have this right, absolute right, power corrupt and absolute power corrupt, absolutely, that's the same. And of course, you're going to have issues when all of the power is centered on, you know, said individuals, notwithstanding to a greatness. And, and we have plenty of precedents for this. And, and of course, it's, it's an unfortunate part of, of reality. And it's moderated, it's mitigated when you have a healthy relationship between those centers of rabbinical authority and a lay community, a society that has other rabbanim who are involved, not at the top of the pedestal. They're not the, the same age and not the same level of detachment. 
but they're there and they're aware of what's going on together with a, a deep professional community, together with a, a deep a community of, of lay leadership that's able to moderate those centers of power and to deal with, with these issues in a more robust and, and a more sophisticated way. And that's, it's just a part of, of a healthy society. And just understand, because, you know, we are B'nai Torah, we are people that care deeply about Masora and what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants of us. So what would you understand to be the theological reason why change needs to happen in this sort of organic flow, this back and forth process, as opposed to something coming through a clear Masora, Rebbe to Talmud, throughout the Doros? So I think, yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I think the, the, the core answer to that is that, you know, Torah is all about the journey of the Jewish people with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's about Am Yisrael. It's about the Jewish people. And the Jewish people has a certain dynamic, and that dynamic is itself a Torah dynamic. That, that's why Minig is such a fundamental element of halacha. What is minig? You know what minig is? It's what the Jews do. There's a certain shechina among the Jewish people, among the people themselves. You know, the, the Pasuk in, in Yirmiyo, Herak Gimel, says that, Lasid lavai, Bahaya bayame mahem, the Pasuk says, lo yoma oid, the Aron Abris, people won't search for the Aron Abris anymore. And Rashi says, because the Shechina will reside among the Jewish people themselves. The, the Rambam writes, where's the authority of the Talmud, the Gemara? Where, where is that authority from? Says the Rambam in his introduction to Mishnah Torah. The, the authority is because the people accepted the Gemara as a binding authority. And, and according to some, even the Sanhedrin draws its authority from the people. Why, why is that? It's because the Shechina resides among the people. I don't have a private covenant with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. No rabbi has a private covenant with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. The Jewish people, B'nai Yisrael, have a covenant. They stood at Har Sinai. They have a covenant with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. And, and a lot of issues in Halacha are resolved in, in this way. It depends on, on the people. Again, is, is when you have a machlekes. Not everything. Again, in the Halachic process, it's, it's, it's an involved issue. But I think in this sense, the theology of this process will be that the way that the Jewish people journey, the way that things evolve, the, the way that we react to societal changes that happen in the world and the way that, that those are somehow integrated and brought in, that itself is Torah. That itself is a part of our developing evolution with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of the Jewish people. And yet, we still need the, the Royim, we need the shepherds, right? We still need those Gudele Rabbanim to be able to regulate, to be able to be that supreme authority, to be able to, to have a, a way of weighing things up and, and making decisions of what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. The same thing that we have for Minhagim, right? Sometimes Rabbanim will say, that's a Minik Shtus. That's a Minik that deserves to be abolished. That's a, that's a bad minute. But often and generally, once a minute becomes established, minute is Torah, Torah, the Yerushalmi. Again, I'm not going to get into the halachic intricacies of, of this sugya, but I think there's a deep theology there of the Jewish people and their journey with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, that there's a shechina that resides uh, among us and, and that these kinds of evolving changes, accumulative you know, changes that happen with the uh, uh, accumulation of, of wisdom and experience that we have, that, that's a part of Torah too, provided by the way, like the Gemara says in Baba Basra you, you can have, if there's a Chacham Ha'ir, then he regulates the changes that are made over there, it's in Ben Adam in business sense, in guilds, in professional stuff, but if there's a Chacham Ha'ir, a Talmud Chacham that he knows how to regulate these in Yonim, then he gets a veto power right? So you have this regulation, but the changes themselves, they come from the Jewish people themselves. And I think there's something very beautiful about that. There's something very true about that. I want to turn to one more meta question, and then I want to get to the topic of the day, really, in the more practical sense. Think of the fact, how do you, as a Haredi person, negotiate the tension between personal intuition, personal moral intuition, 
and sublimation or surrender. Meaning, what do people do if, according to their own logic, they can't defend a certain status quo, they believe something should change, something should be different. But they hear from great Rabbanim, and let's say this is you know not being misrepresented, this is the authentic perspective of these Rabbanim. So how do you deal with this sort of tension between the suspension of personal agency? Do you see that as a sense of fidelity to the concept of Masora? Or alternatively, you could see that as an abdication of personal responsibility, of being this lay leader who takes the initiative to inaugurate certain changes that eventually might gain a foothold, might gain rabbinic approval or endorsement down the line. So at what point does a person surrender their own moral intuition? At what point does a person double down, embrace it, even though it may fly in the face of the perspectives that are being disseminated from quote unquote on high? Well, you know, the, the Mishnah teaches us, Rav, you know, everyone needs to have his own rabbinic guidance, his own Rav that, that he speaks to, that he takes counsel from. And that Rav that a person has also acts as a certain in-between, moderation between G'dayle Torah, the, the rabbinic leadership, and between the individual who wants to do something, who wants to initiate, who wants to uh, make a decision for himself, and, and he's not sure, like, what do I do? My own individual instinct tells me that I need to do X. But I know that there's this up there, there's this rabbinic statement, which is not a personal statement, right? It's often a, a broad communal statement. So then how do I navigate that? Do, do I say, well, it doesn't apply to me because my circumstances are special, right? Or within my space, I, I just see this need is too urgent and, and something has to be done, right? So how do you navigate that tension? Well, I, I think I say the harav. I think it's very important for every person to have his own rav. And when you choose your own rav, of course, you choose that together with your own disposition, together with your own inclinations, which are, of course, founded by your personal uh, intuition, right? Your, your, your internal motions, internal kind of um, uh, thought motions, the, the way you see the world and so on, that, that's how you choose your rabbi, right? You choose somebody that you're able to be in conversation with, to somebody but somebody that is a, a rabbinical authority and, and somebody that will be able to give you guidance on that. Now, what happens if your rav, you know, uh, be, betrays your intuition? You have a problem, <laughs> you know, it's a, a li life is not free of problems and, you know, ultimately each person has to, be able to navigate the tensions that he's going to have. But I think that having a personal rav, somebody that you take guidance from, who's not up there in the sphere of G'dayli Rabbani, but somebody that you'll be able to sit with and give you quality time, and he knows you, and he knows how you think, and you know him well, and you respect him, and, and you have you know a, a deep relationship, that helps a lot when you have questions such as these, when there's a tension between like a general if you want hurrah, general instruction for the general community, and you have attention with a personal decision that you have to make in your own, whether it's private life or whether it's within a, 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 a space in the from community, and you want to know how to navigate that, a selich rav. If you have a rav, that can be a great help in navigating that tension. Let's turn now specifically to the topic of army conscription, Haredi participation in the army, it would seem to me, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a pretty overwhelming response from the Haredi rabbinic leadership that seems to be opposed to any wholesale concessions or changes, notwithstanding perhaps either explicit or tacit approval for certain particular frameworks that support certain substrata of the society. But writ large, there seems to be an overarching opposition. Is that the case? You know, and if so, how, how would you analogize that perhaps to 
the, let's say the base Yaakov movement of hundred years, 150 years ago? Well, you know, nothing is copy paste. You know, this isn't a base Yaakov moment. Each, uh, you know, each era and each issue has its own dynamic. But for the issue of army conscription, there's no question in my eyes that those working in the area of Haredi participation in the IDF are working in absolute cooperation with Gedalia Rabbanim. And it's not, a, it's not a spoken cooperation, but it's an absolute cooperation. The Gedalia Rabbanim are often speaking against army service, yes. But they're also relying on the fact that there are going to be people who are working to make sure that those boys who do go into the army, and there are boys going into the army, and some are being encouraged to go into the army, they're able to do their army service in the proper environment, in a way that will be able to uh, contain their Haredi identity and not undermine their religious life and, and so on. And, and there's a, if you want, it's a kind of tacit agreement, right? The, the, the Rav Shach and Rav Aaron Leib and before him Rav Avramsky and, and others, they all said very clearly, kids who are not in full-time learning, kids, right? Young men who are not in full-time learning should be in the army. Now, that hasn't be said, been said, at least not loud, for the last few decades. Because the issues have changed and because the sensitivities have changed. And, and that hasn't been said. But at the same time, most Rabbanim, when asked on a one-on-one -on -one level, of course they won't object to this. They won't voice their support. There's a lot of sensitivity around the issue. But they won't object either. You know, Rav Yitzhak Ezrachi, he came recently. Our Netzach Yehuda had a memorial event for fallen soldiers. And Rav Yitzchok came to give a shir. He didn't come to the ceremony, but he came to give a shir to Haredi soldiers. And, and he cares deeply about these soldiers. He didn't come and say, Rahman al none of you should be here. He came and he, and he gave a shir. And, and, and there are many Rabbanim that would be in a similar place of, listen, on the one hand, we're very aware of the potential pitfalls of the dangers of what could happen if this becomes a wholesale trend. On the other hand, we're also relying on the fact that there are some Haredi soldiers, because listen, it's very clear that the state of Israel, Israeli society, is not going to put up with a situation in which there are no Haredim serving in the IDF. That's obvious, that's clear. So we need people in the field working with boys who are not kind of for learning, who are falling by the wayside of the yeshiva institutions and should be in the IDF. And those individuals who are working with those young men are doing a huge favor to Haredi society and to the Gdeli Rabbanim. And, and the Rabbanim appreciate this. There's no question that they're aware of this and they appreciate it and, the, and that they, they're grateful to those working in, in the field in, in this sense. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. And and you don't have to, you know, go back to Rabbi Aaron Leib, who has a letter about, about Netzach Yehuda. Without that, we, we don't need to, to rely on, on letters that were written 30 years ago. We, 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 can, we can speak about the situation now. I have no doubt that this is a good example of this kind of relationship, which is a delicate and, and nuanced relationship that allows things to happen in the field that are necessary and required. And in this, in this case, required because of general Israeli society, required because of the moral internal need of, of the Haredi space, re required for a whole plethora of, of, of reasons. It's, it's something that's necessary, something that needs to happen. However, the Gedele Rabbanim do not want it to happen from them. They don't want to be the ones saying, Rabbi Isai, we need to send X number of people to the army. That would be something that goes against the grain of their rabbinic intuition or their intuition as those standing at the top of the pyramid. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations with, with Gudur Rabbanim that have said, listen, these are things that, you know, they, they shouldn't be coming from me. I'm not the one to say this statement. This has to come from people working in the field. And, and, and that's a, it's a relationship. And I think that this is a very good example of that. It's a good illustration 
of of how things things happen. Of course, it's not easy, and and it's you know it's it's a balance that's hard to strike and a delicate one. And the whole time it's in flux, and and there's a dynamic going on, which, which is not easy to navigate for for anybody. But but those in the field have to do what 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 they have to do to see the challenges, to appreciate the gravitas of the moment, the the need for Haredim to be a part of the IDF, absolutely. And you have Kedule Rabbanim who have you know attended you know Levias and Chas Shalom, We shouldn't know anymore of Haredi soldiers and and been there and and showed their identification. Absolutely. And and at the same time, being wary, if you're in that space, in the, in the Gedolim space, being wary of every word you say can have like a, a great impact and huge ripple effects. There's a trepidation there. You know, every word can make a big difference when, when, you're, when you're held in such awe and then every word is taken to have such meaning and such impact. There's sometimes you prefer things to come from the field and, and let's see how they progress and then we'll weigh in later. Let, let's see what happens. And the army is absolutely, you know, what one of one of those issues. While it also has the complexity of the political situation, of the Knesset members, of how to vote, of what the law is gonna say, all of that adds a layer of complexity that doesn't necessarily exist in other issues. In the army issue, of course, that's a, a big part of it too. I guess one could wonder you know, why there seems to be a lack of transparency. In other words, why do the pronouncements have to be so secretive? You know, there's sort of this like wink-wink game, like you said, that, that can sometimes take place. You know, why can't a, a great Rav get up and say, these frameworks should be supported for these kinds of people, express the opinion as it truly is, rather than people sort of needing to sort of guess or quietly learn these opinions and then but not be allowed to quote who said them because those rabbis can't be associated with those opinions. It all takes on this kind of spiritual air. Right. I also feel I'm dancing around that a little bit. I confess that sometimes I, I wish things would be more transparent and more clear cut also. I'll I'll be very forthright and say that we have an issue with "Quote unquote leadership in in the Haredi space. By the way, not every godal sees himself as a leader in the common sense of the word, because leaders sometimes have to, you know, be brave and courageous and make changes, and that's not necessarily how Gedolei Rabbanim see their 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 purpose, see their raison d'être. It's more, you know, to to regulate and to preserve and to conserve and to to react and so on. It's not your classic." It's not necessarily your classic leadership role. And that very much depends on which persona we're speaking about. Obviously, Gedolim are not made you know, of the same mold. And sometimes the lack of transparency and, and the kind of you know, hushed atmosphere of how these you know, rabbinic, uh, whether it's instructions or whether it's letters and so on, come forth uh, can be frustrating. I would just point out that there's a lot of precedent for this. It's not like this was... Uh, an, an idea or a phenomenon that began in the 21st century. Uh, you know, the Gemara already has a uh, precedence of halachic rulings that are given in a in a you know in a shushu way, right? This is a, a halacha, but it's not uh, darshan berabim, right? We don't proclaim this in public because it's not something that we want discussed among the hamayin ha'am among the 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 populace among among the masses. We want this to be kept in the you know in the in the higher echelons of the base medrash environment among the uh, gedoli rabbanim. It's not like there's no precedent uh, for this idea. You sometimes feel that in today's world that's taken to a bit of an extreme, and that that itself can have its kind of um, unintended consequences or you know certain damage because of the. Lack of transparency. I think it's also a generational issue, meaning in in our generation we've become accustomed to the demand for transparency. I think in the past that demand didn't exist. It was kind of accepted that a lot of decisions are made behind closed doors in a process that wasn't transparent, and that was accepted. And today, in a more democratic world, that transparency is an expectation that we've picked up and we've internalized and to be honest i you know i think it's a it's overall it's it's a it's a positive development but you know in 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 conservative societies 
these kind of changes uh, also take time. And, and uh, I think we're also maybe developing that, internalizing it in our you know, social media oriented world, our instant oriented world, this becomes much more pronounced, it becomes much more prominent than it used to be in bygone times, you know, bygone time 25 years ago, you know what I mean? But yeah, things change quickly these days. And I think time will tell how, how that plays out. I think, I think there is a, a trend towards a, a greater kind of dis- dispersion. Is that the right word? Bizarre. You know, a, a greater, uh, you know, sharing of rabbinical authority. It's not quite what it was in, in the days of Rav Shach when you had this sole leader, rabbinical authority, God al or whatever he says goes, but we're not in that era anymore. There, there's a greater, let's say, dispersal and the distribution of authority among, you know, different rabbinim. And that itself, I think, uh, is going to lead to greater transparency. I'll just say that there is one more issue, and that is that you always have the more extreme rabbinim and the and the less extreme rabbinim. And, I mean, again, extreme for want of a better word over here, but those who are less strident, less uh, inclined to, you know, to shut down every development, will sometimes be fearful to speak their mind because they don't want to create this friction or this possible, you know, fallout with the rabbinic to their right, to their, you know, religious right. And that's been for me a, you know, it, it's been it's been a real, you know, issue because, you know, even even very prominent rabbinim are sometimes, you know, reticent, reluctant uh, to speak their mind because of, you know, what might happen to them because the more extreme forces will then go out against them and then they'll be, as it were, ostracized and people will say, you know, Rabbeinu Sarme Aderech, you know, our, our great rabbi is, is no longer the great rabbi that we thought him to be. This has been a problem on, on a variety of issues, whether it's, you know, in, in the, back in the olden days when we had simple phones and, you know, questions like, should we allow, I don't know, SMS messages? So there was like one particular rabbinical authority who was fire and brimstone against it. And other rabbinical authorities, you know, thought, you know, why not? Like, you know, getting SMS messages is, is uh, you know, useful means of communication. But, you know, they, they just felt unable to speak their minds about it because you had this, you know, this, oh, I don't know, Mahadran buses. Not every Rav agreed Mahadran buses was a good idea, you know. Um, we've had non-Mahadran buses for many years. Like, yeah. But the, the more moderate voices on that, even among great rabbinical authorities, are kind of um, become drowned out by the more strident voices. And, and that's just a kind of a, a problem within the system. Something to think about, but not something for me to solve. I'm busy with other issues. Finally, Early Pfeffer, what would you be your advice to a person who feels they, they see a need for a change in any area, but they want to maintain fidelity to Masora and they want to work from within the Haredi system, the Haredi world, and still make an impact? What's your advice for such an individual? Uh, I say the Harav, I say the Harav, there are many. Rabbanim within the Haredi space who are not, you know, the top tier. I'm not talking about, you know, Gudeli Hadar. Rabbanim that you know, that know you. Rabbanim that are familiar with the issue or you can help them to become very familiar with it. Rabbanim that you can bring others to speak to. Take counsel from them. Talk to them. E- even Ania Katan, you know, I- I'm, I'm a, consider myself a very young in the, in the rabbinic, you know, uh, Tier and and not very senior, and and even even to me, you know, many come I guess more within the Anglo space, you know, to discuss different initiatives and and different ideas, and I myself go to my rabbanim and and so on. And I say the it's it's wonderful and it's a privilege to be able to take counsel from rabbanim, and and the fact that you have gedoli adar does not nullify, does not annul the relationship between a person and his rav, and of course we can't all be tamidim of one Gdolator, right? We all have the Rabbanim that know us, that we know them, that we are able to relate to them and they're able to relate to us. And Chas for Shalom, that we should erase that by kind of outsourcing it to, to one Godel. That it just doesn't work like that. The world doesn't work like that. It shouldn't work like that. And I would strongly recommend Asel uh, it's not It's not my recommendation. So it's a Mishnah and it's Chazal's recommendation. But I think for your question, 
that's a that's a very very important guideline, and certainly that's uh, that's what I, I rely on myself. Rabbi Yeshua Pfeffer, thank you for your Das Torah on this very important topic of Das Torah. Ah, uh, thank you, Ravari. It's certainly important. I hope it's been, you know, in in interesting and instructive. And uh, I don't think we've said the last word on this. It's uh, much more to be spoken and much more to be said. Mir Hashem for future episodes of of this podcast. Just one final thought, really an open ended question, as we conclude today's very consequential episode. Danielle Allen, in a book called Talking to Strangers. Anxieties of Citizenship Since Brown versus Board of Education, distinguishes between two types of questions. One she calls a hard question. A hard question is that which requires specialized knowledge to answer. On the other hand, there is what's called a big question. A big question is a question that matters to everyone and that everyone can answer. Big questions have the potential to tap people's sense of curiosity to draw out wisdom from the heart. When we think about the question of Haredi army service, is it a hard question? Does one need real profound depth of knowledge, both in societal norms, Torah hashkafa, risks and concerns, and many, many more aspects in order to answer the question? Or Is it a big question, a question that through the employment of intuition, good faith, conversation, appropriate investigation, many can come to answer in a satisfying manner? Or perhaps it's both. I leave that as a parting thought on this episode of the EUN Podcast.